Well, good evening. It's good to be back and good to hopefully see you there uh, ready to sing uh, this Wednesday evening. Uh, find your hymn book, though, for sure. Uh, hymn number 59. My Lord is near me all the time. Aren't you glad that's possible today? He's near each one of us all the time. My Lord is. Amen. Let's sing it together. In the lightning flash across the sky, His mighty power I see. And I know if He can rain on high, His light can shine on me. I've seen it in the lightning, heard it in the thunder, and felt it. shakes the mighty hills and trembles every tree. Then I know a God so great and strong can surely harbor me. I've seen it in the lightning, heard it in the thunder, and felt it
hymn. I've sung that all my life. Savior like a shepherd lead us. Well, uh, we finished our walk through the tabernacle last week. We spent seven weeks uh, going on a tour, going through the courtyard, walking into the holy place, looking at all the different elements, and then walking in to the Holy of Holies last week. And as, and as I finished last week, I just felt like there was something uh, left undone. And, and so while we are, uh, you know, before we get too far away from the line of thinking of the tabernacle, I just wanted to spend a night telling a story. This evening, I'd like for us to just simply walk through the timeline of what happened after the children of Israel built the tabernacle. So tonight, I want to spend our time basically, very simply, following the ark. Uh, if you'll have your uh, Bibles open, there are just a few places that I would like for us to turn, uh, and I'm not going to have slides on the, the passages, so I want, I want you to look them up yourself or, or take notes and look them up later, because we're going to kind of walk through a... Uh, centuries of history tonight. Uh, so uh, I hope you're you're ready. Uh, sometimes, you know, to some people, history is a boring thing. It used to be to me until I started uh, putting things together with Scripture, and then it got exciting. And I hope that's the way it is for you tonight as we walk through this history and kind of see what happened. What was the rest of the story, as Paul Harvey used to say? Well. After Moses died, we know that Joshua became the designated leader. He was the one that Moses had, had uh, helped and, and uh, had mentored, basically. He had been a part of all the major uh, events. He was an, an adult when they walked through the Red Sea. Uh, now it was 40 years later, and uh, he was an older adult, but he had that leadership ability. So he became the undisputed leader of the people of Israel. And with Joshua, it was now time to lead these two million or however many there were, these children of Israel, into the promised land. So Joshua sent word out to all the people to reiterate the fact that the Ark of the Covenant was always going to lead out. The Ark of the Covenant would be carefully wrapped by those who were designated to be allowed to, be, uh, to, to do that function those Levites, those priests, it would be wrapped, and then the, the Levites would pick up the poles, uh, the poles and begin to move. And when that took place, Joshua wanted to make sure everybody knew, that's when you start getting ready to leave, because we are moving out. God is leading us out. And so he told them, when you see the Ark of the Covenant begin to move, follow along. But, he said, follow along at a distance. In fact, specifically, they were not to get within half a mile. Now think about that, going through the wilderness. The Ark of the Covenant was going to be half a mile ahead of the throngs of people following behind. The Ark was uh, carried across the Jordan as they started to enter the Promised Land. And you know the story that uh, Joshua told the, the priests who were carrying the Ark to to go stand in the water. And when all of the, all four of them were in the water with the Ark of the Covenant, suddenly the flow of the river stopped. And, and in fact, we were told in Joshua that the water stood up. So basically you had a wall of water. I don't know if they could see it because it was upstream. But God basically put his hand and stopped the water so that all the children of Israel could walk across the, the Jordan on dry land. Commemorative of what had happened 40 years before, uh, when Moses led them uh, across the, the Red Sea. Um, the Ark of the Covenant was carried around Jericho. Now, at that point, I'm sure they could get closer than half a mile, but it was part of the procession that went around Jericho for seven days straight. And on the seventh day, uh, the trumpets blasted and the walls of Jericho came down. Well, as the children of Israel began to take over the land of the promise, Joshua instructed them, according to Joshua chapter 18, to set up the tabernacle in the town of Shiloh. 
Now I have a map. That's our only slide tonight, but I wanted to be able to show you, okay, you know, we the common figure of the Dead Sea and the Mediterranean Sea over here. So you got your bearings is Israel. And this these arrows are actually uh, the path that, that um, Joshua and the children of Israel went. They went first to Jericho, which is right here. And I want you to see Shiloh is up here. So we're going to be hearing about Bethel and Ai, but that's kind of where everything is. Jerusalem is right here. So that kind of gives you an idea where we're talking about. Well, Joshua uh, gave them instruction to build, to construct the tabernacle and set it up at Shiloh, which is where it would stay for quite some time. Um, more specifically, we're told there was, a, there was a highway that went from Bethel up to Shechem. And so the tabernacle was built just east of that highway. So right around in here, just outside of Shiloh. That's where the tabernacle was set up. Now, there's a period of time, according to Judges chapter 20, when apparently the Levites moved the tabernacle 10 miles south to Bethel for whatever reason. We're not told about it. All we know is that in Judges 20, it says that the tabernacle was in, uh, in Bethel. Uh, we're also told in this parenthetical comment that Aaron's grandson Phineas uh, was high priest at that time. Now, why would, th this area was, was very significant. So it, it doesn't surprise me that that would be where the tabernacle was set up. Uh, between Bethel and Ai uh, was where Abraham first placed his tent when he, when he and Sarah first arrived at the promised land. Uh, you'll, you might remember the town of Bethel got its name from Jacob. It had been called Luz before that, but uh, when Jacob was running from Esau and headed toward, uh, toward where he would meet his uh, wives and have his family, uh, you remember he uh, found a smooth rock and he used it as a pillow and, then, and that night had that dream of the ladder with the angels ascending and descending. And so when he woke up, he said, this is obviously the gate of heaven. And so he named the place Bethel. So their own ancestor, Jacob, had named the area. Uh, so this area had a lot of significance to the children of Israel. So it wouldn't surprise me that if for some reason they needed to move uh, the, the tabernacle, it would stay in that area. That was a, a key area for all of them. But we're not told anything about it. But by the time of Samuel, we know that the tabernacle was back in Shiloh. As we begin reading the story of Hannah, Samuel's mom, it was in Shiloh that she went to uh, ask of the Lord. And, and the high priest then was Eli. And remember, he came to her and, and uh, thought she was drunk. She wasn't drunk. She was just saddened by the fact that she was barren. And she promised that if God would give her a son, that he would give that child back to the Lord. And so after Samuel was weaned, she took him back to Shiloh, and he was raised in the temple. Uh, that incredible uh, story when uh, apparently Samuel slept in close proximity to the Ark of the Covenant. He was probably in the holy place. Uh, Eli was not a good high priest. His sons were horrible. Uh, there wasn't a whole lot of holiness in the priesthood already at the time of Samuel. And so apparently Samuel slept inside the tent of meeting uh, because that's where he heard the voice of the Lord. I remember saying, Samuel, Samuel. And Eli, after the third time, said, next time you hear it, say, yes, Lord, I'm listening. Well, that began the ministry of Samuel. And, and as Samuel established himself as a prophet in Israel, the armies of Israel decided to go out to battle with the Philistines. Well, that battle was horrendous. They were soundly beaten. So as an indication of where their hearts were. Now, we, we walked through what God had told them. This is what it means to be my people. I want to live in your camp. I want to live in your midst. 
this is what you need to do in order for the God of the universe to live with you. And they were given all these instructions. By the time of Samuel, there weren't a whole lot of God-fearing people. And as indication of where their hearts were, the armies didn't call on the prophet to inquire of God, should we go against the Philistines? Should we go back into battle after being soundly defeated? What is it? Why is it that we were, uh, were not successful? No, that's not what they did at all. They sent to Shiloh to get the ark. And Eli's sons, Hophni and Phinehas, were all too pleased to take it from the tabernacle and carry it to the Israelite camp. You see, already they had lost sight of the holiness of God and treated God's presence more like a rabbit's foot than like a holy God. I want to pause there for a minute. How easy it is for God's people to forget his holiness and start using God like a rabbit's foot. Think about those who live their lives as if God doesn't exist. But boy, you get them in a tough spot and they're crying out to God. Oh God, please get me out of this. If, if whatever I need to say to you to make you move on my behalf, that's what I'm going to say. Whatever I do, I, I, I want to do whatever you say because I want to get out of this trouble. You are my rabbit's foot. And as soon as the trouble's over, they're back to doing things their own way. Well, that's how the army was they didn't ask they didn't care about God's will they figured we've heard stories about what the Ark of the Covenant did when it led the the armies of Israel so we want that to happen again so go get the Ark and let's put it out front and the Philistines will run well of course the Philistines heard that the Ark was in the camp and it scared the bejiglins out of them because they had heard also about what uh, what God had done um, but they went out to battle anyway, and the Philistines killed 30,000 Israelites that day, including Hophni and Phinehas. And worst of all, they captured the ark. That was the first time since it was constructed. That was the first time since Moses led the children of Israel to build the tabernacle that the ark of the covenant was in enemy hands. Well, I'm not going to go all the way through uh, that scenario, but, uh, uh, well, let me just mention, uh, when the news came back to Eli, the high priest, that not only were his sons dead, but the ark had been captured. Uh, uh, Eli was apparently a pretty fat man, and he was so shocked that he fell back, and the weight of his body broke his neck, and he died. That exact same day, Phineas, the, the son of Eli who had been killed, his wife was pregnant. And that news caused her to go into labor, and she died in labor. But before she said her last, before she took her last breath, she said, The son's name is Ichabod, for the glory has left Israel. You see, the Ark of the Covenant was now in enemy's hands. Well, as you remember, the Philistines soon realized they'd bitten off more than they can chew. And I'm not going to go through all the details of what happened, but needless to say, they sent the ark back. And when the Israelites got it, they disrespected God's holiness again. And they opened it. They looked inside. And the Bible says over 50,000 died that day in Israel. More than the Philistines had killed. 50,000 died that day because they disrespected the holiness of God. Now, needless to say, that scared the daylights out of them. And so they quickly took the Ark of, of the Covenant to the home of a Levite named Abinadab. And then they consecrated Abinadab's son, Eliezer, to be the high priest. We realized their high priest and the high priest's sons had just been killed. They had nobody. They needed a descendant of Aaron. They didn't really care who it was. And apparently Abinadab 
fit the bill and his son fit the bill so they consecrated him high priest and the Ark of the Covenant stayed in his house not in the tabernacle in Shiloh but in the house of Abinadab well presumably the tabernacle stayed intact in Shiloh and the Ark remained in this home for 50 years somewhere around 50 years now why do I know that well Psalm 78, and I'd like you to turn there. Psalm 78 has some interesting tidbits to help fill in the, the history. In Psalm 78, the, the psalmist wrote about, uh, about this time frame. Give me just a second because I did not write down the verse. Silly me. In, uh, in Psalm 78, and I'm just going to read it to you. Oh, here it is right here. Good. Uh, notice verse 60. It's a long psalm. Verse 60, it says, So God, he abandoned the dwelling place at Shiloh the tent which he had pitched among men. Okay, so that's when uh, God allowed Phineas and his brother to, to take the Ark of the Covenant away from Shiloh. That should not have been allowed, but God allowed it because he was abandoning the tent that he had pitched among men. That was the first time since, uh, other than when they were moving from place to place, that the Ark of the Covenant was outside of the tabernacle. God abandoned the tent in verse 61 and gave up his strength to captivity. He went in the, uh, into the arms of the, the Philistines and his glory into the hand of the adversary. He also delivered his people to the sword and was filled with the wrath at his inheritance. Fire devoured his young men and his virgins had no wedding songs. His priests fell by the sword and his widows could not weep. Then the Lord awoke as if from sleep. So while in the hands of the Philistines, if you know the story, uh, God struck them and he caused their God Dagon to, to lie prostrate at his, his feet. But as if awoken like a warrior, he drove his adversaries backwards. And then look at verse 67. He rejected the tent of Joseph and did not choose the tribe of Ephraim. Okay. Shiloh, where the tent was, is in the tribe of Ephraim, which would have been one of the two tribes of Joseph, Ephraim and Manasseh. So the psalmist is saying exactly what happened. He rejected the tent of Joseph, but look at verse 68, but chose the tribe of Judah, Mount Zion, which he loved, and he built his sanctuary like the heights, like the earth, which he has founded forever. And we'll get to that in just a minute. So Shiloh, uh, being a tribe of Ephraim, God abandoned the tent completely. So though the tabernacle apparently remained there, the ark, which symbolized God's presence, stayed in Kiriath-Jerim, which is right down here, which is kind of on the border of, of Benjamin and Judah. It's on the northern, uh, northern side of Judah. So the ark stayed on the northern border of Judah. And that's why Psalm 78 says that the tribe of Judah was chosen and God chose David, his servant. First Chronicles 13 says straight up that the people of Israel did not seek the ark during the time of Saul. So you might remember from Samuel, Samuel was the last of the judges and he anointed the first king, which would have been Saul. Saul reigned for 40 years over Israel. Not once did Saul give two hoots about where the Ark of the Covenant was. He didn't seek the Ark. Sure enough, after David was made king over all of Israel, uh, which in the timeline, so when Saul died, David became king of Judah, not of all Israel. And he stayed just king of it, uh, Judah for seven years. When he was made king over all of Israel, that's when we get to the next scene 
uh, of the ark. So about 50 years, it, uh, the ark of the covenant stayed in this man's home, Abinadab. When David was made king over all Israel, he attacked the Jebusites and he captured Jerusalem. That's when David said, it is time to bring the Ark of the Covenant home. Only problem is, David didn't read the special handling instructions. He didn't read how you're supposed to transport the Ark of the Covenant. He just decided that, that just celebrating and worshiping was all that was, a, uh, was required. He had a brand new cart made. It was probably a very beautiful cart. And he went down to carry out Jerem, and he excitedly told him, put the Ark of the Covenant on the cart. We're taking uh, the Ark home. And they had a party, and they were pulling on this cart. And sure enough, the cart hit a rock, and the Ark of the Covenant shifted on the cart. And a man uh, named Uzzah reached up to steady the ark. Well, you don't touch the ark of the covenant. I don't care what your motive. That's the holiness of God. You don't touch the ark. Uzzah was immediately incinerated. He was killed. That made David so upset that he just found the closest place where he could find it. Uh, it was actually the, the home of a Gittite one of the tribes of the Philistines. Uh, this, uh, this Gittite, he put the Ark of the Covenant in his home. He says, you keep it until I figure out what to do. So it was there for three months. Well, it was during those three months that David apparently found the directions. And he read how you're supposed to transport the Ark. And so he came back to the Gittite's home now, it's not clear whether the rest of the tabernacle was brought from Shiloh as well, but we know from what David said that the ark was housed in a tent of some kind. They brought it into Jerusalem. Remember, that's when David was dancing and his wife, Michal, got all upset at him because he, she thought he looked foolish. He brought it into Jerusalem, and that's where it was set up. But because it was in a tent... And David had this gorgeous house that he had built for him. That got his creative juices flowing. And he said, God does not belong in a tent. And he started the plans for the great, magnificent temple. Of course, David was not allowed to build it. But when David died and his son Solomon took over, uh, the, the temple was made. But before we get to that, to my knowledge, from the time that Joshua died, very rarely did all of the tabernacle rituals take place. They didn't take place in the time of Saul. The Ark of the Covenant wasn't even anywhere close. To my knowledge, the feasts weren't celebrated during the time of David. At least I can't find any of them mentioned. As a matter of fact, there's a note during the, the reign of King uh, Josiah, centuries later, that said that he reinstituted the Passover, and such a Passover had not been celebrated from the days of the judges who judged Israel. Now think what I just said there. Josiah lived somewhere around, he, he reigned somewhere around 640 B.C. Moses brought the children of Israel out of Egypt somewhere around 1460 B.C. After the wilderness, the Passover was not widely celebrated in all of Israel from the time of the death of, of, uh, of Joshua. When David passed away and he passed the baton to his son Solomon, Solomon took his father's plans and built the magnificent temple. Now we're told in 1 Kings chapter 6 that from the time that Israel left Egypt to the time the temple started construction was 480 years. Now the first 40 was in the wilderness. They were practicing all that God said. The remaining 440 years, hardly at all, hardly at all did they practice the law of Moses. 480 years since the tabernacle was 
uh, was constructed. 1 Kings 8 details the incredible day, though. It was in the seventh month. I don't think that's by accident. The seventh month held uh, several different feasts. But in the seventh month, after uh, the Solomon's temple was constructed, he held a great feast. And the Ark of the Covenant was finally brought in to the newly constructed Holy of Holies. And we have an incredible uh, description of how God's holiness filled the temple. And, and in fact, nobody could go in it. Very much like in the days of old when the glory of God filled the tabernacle. By then, according to 2 Chronicles 5, nothing was in the ark. Now remember, as we finished our tabernacle study, uh, the Holy of Holies had four items in it. Remember? There was the two tablets of the law. There was the jar of manna. And there was the rod of Aaron that had budded. Well, according to 2 Chronicles 5, all that was in the Ark of the Covenant at this point was the law of Moses. I don't know what happened to the jar of manna. I don't know what happened to the, uh, the rod of Aaron. But the only thing left, according to 2 Chronicles 5, were the two tablets from Moses. But it was finally in its resting place in the magnificent temple of Solomon. Unfortunately, Solomon's heart was soon steered away from the Lord. And after his death, the kingdom was divided. The northern kingdom, which retained the name Israel, never, ever returned to the Lord. As a nation, they continually rebelled. Golden calves were set up on the northern extreme and the southern extreme of the northern kingdom. Those were the places that Jeroboam had set up uh, to worship so that his people wouldn't be going all the way down to, to Jerusalem because he wanted them to serve the gods that he appointed. And they never turned back to God. Pretty much anything that was worshipped by any pagan with whom they came in contact was added to their pantheon. Now, there was a remnant of each tribe that would travel down to Jerusalem. Some of them moved to Judah to get away from the paganism. So there was a remnant of each tribe, but as a nation of Israel, they completely rebelled. The, the God-fearers were the exception. In the southern kingdom, which took the name Judah, they kept a loose connection to Yahweh, which would be periodically renewed. But as soon as a king came to power who was not committed to Yahweh, the whole kingdom turned back to false gods. Of the 20 monarchs who ruled over the southern kingdom of Judah, including one queen, only eight of them are described as fearing God. Only eight of them pleased God. In fact, one of those eight was King Hezekiah, who reigned in Judah at the time that God removed the northern kingdom uh, of Israel. Uh, God sent Assyria to take away the northern kingdom in 722. Well, the king in Judah at that time was Hezekiah. In the description of the reforms that Hezekiah did in Jerusalem, who was a godly king, 2 Kings 18 mentions that he finally destroyed the bronze serpent that Moses had constructed in the wilderness. Now think about that. Do you remember the story in the wilderness of the bronze serpent? They had hung on to that bronze serpent. And there were those in Judah that worshipped that serpent. They gave it the name Nahushtan. And it was their god Nahushtan, the bronze serpent. Well, Hezekiah finally destroyed that. The last good king to reign over Judah was the one I mentioned a moment ago. King Josiah. King Josiah reigned from 640 to 609 B.C. And in 2 Chronicles 35, it tells uh, where it was telling about him reinstituting the Passover. It also says that he commanded that the ark be brought back into the temple. Now, I don't know where, I don't know when it left the temple. I, I don't know, but that gives you an idea how wicked the Judah, the kings of Judah had been. Uh, I know Manasseh set up some uh, some abominations in the temple. Was it removed at that time? I, I don't know for sure. But part of Josiah's reforms was to bring the ark back into the temple. 
Upon Josiah's death, no other king pleased God. Over 120 years of sporadic evil kings in Judah kept them from ever completely honoring God. And upon Josiah's death, there was only 20 years left in the storyline of Judah. During that 20 years, three of Josiah's sons reigned as king and one grandson. Not one of them was godly. In fact, they were just as bad as any. It was during the reign of the last king of Judah, Zedekiah, a son of Josiah, that the prophet Ezekiel received his vision. This week's scripture reading, I hope you're staying up with our scripture reading, but turn with me to Ezekiel, if you would. In this year's, I mean, in this week's scripture reading, uh, it mentions this, the, the saddest moment in the history of Israel. An event that took place that only Ezekiel was allowed to witness. Ezekiel said that he was taken into the holy place where instead of tending the lamps of incense, keeping the, uh, I mean, keep, uh, tending the lamps and making sure they were trimmed, keeping the incense on the altar, and making sure that the the bread of the presence was fresh. Instead of doing that, what he was shown was the priests on their faces toward the east, bowing to the sun. Not to mention the pagan rituals being performed in the outer court. So in Ezekiel chapter 9, if you turn there, Ezekiel chapter 9, the prophet reported seeing the glory of the God of Israel lifting off the cherub and moving to the threshold of the temple. Lifting off the cherub, that tells me that the Ark of the Covenant was there at that time because it would have been the cherub that was on the mercy seat. So the Spirit of God lifting up from where he would normally be in the Holy of Holies and moving to the threshold of the temple. Then we find in Ezekiel chapter 10, verse 18, the prophet reported seeing the glory of the Lord leave the threshold of the temple and stand over the cherubim. Now, these cherubim are the ones that the apostle John called the four living beings. Uh, they apparently carry the throne of God, and then when the throne of God becomes stationary, they rise up above and, and praise him like Isaiah saw in Isaiah chapter 6. And cry out, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. That's the cherubim. So the, the glory of God moved up over the cherubim, basically sitting on his throne to, be, to, uh, to leave, basically was the, the scene here. Then in Ezekiel chapter 11, verse 23, the prophet reports seeing the glory of the Lord lift up from the city of Jerusalem, go outside the walls of Jerusalem, to the east and be over the Mount of Olives, the mountain which is east of the city. Just in a few years, King Nebuchadnezzar came and ransacked the city, burned down the temple, and hauled off the people of Judah, the ones that were left, that weren't killed or died by famine, left to take to Babylon and they were exiled for 70 years, thus beginning the time of the Gentiles, the time that Daniel talked about, where you had Babylon followed by Persia, followed by Greece, followed by Rome, and then on into our future, where there'll be a, a 10 ruler uh, confederacy that are gonna give their authority to the Antichrist. But that began the time of the Gentiles. Ever since that moment, there has not been a throne of Israel. Yeah, we had King Herod, uh, but not the same. He was a vassal king. Rome was in charge. Israel has never been an autonomous uh, nation with a king ever since. That's what happened 
God had gone to these, all these extremes to make sure that his people knew what was expected of them so that they could have the very God of the universe dwell in their midst. And the people met his instructions with a yawn. The people met his instructions uh, turning their nose up. We've spent seven weeks walking through the tabernacle, what God had provided so that they could, uh, so that God could be in their midst. You know, I, I hear people talk about the vengeful God of the Old Testament or the God of wrath of the Old Testament. I just shake my head thinking, you have no idea of the incredible patience of the God of the Old Testament. And to think, the children of Israel were the best people on the planet. So we can't stand in judgment of them. Our ancestors were worse. To think that God would go to that much trouble and yet still send his own son to die for us. Why in the world would he do that? That's patience. That's long-suffering. That's love. When we talk about the God of the universe loving us, Think about what he allowed, what he put up with, what he endured. And then he gave his own only begotten son that we might live. That's a God of love. And that's our study for tonight. I wanted to, to do that. I'll be honest with you for myself. I had never actually walked through exactly all the the turns of what happened to the tabernacle and the ark. And to be honest with you, it was kind of shocking to, to learn how little was done uh, with what we talked about with the tabernacle. But I'd like to now call us to prayer. Um, I hope that you received our prayer list from, from Betty today. We have quite a few in our church that need a special touch from the Lord. Um, we've got some praises. We've got some people still uh, sick and needing a touch from the Lord. So I want to encourage you to pray, to uh, uh, take your prayer list and, and, and pick some names and pray. I want to encourage you to, to pray for our election that's coming up in November. Pray for our country. Pray for the wisdom of our leaders. But most importantly, pray for the kingdom of God that through all of this, God's will will be done and that people will come to know the saving name of Jesus Christ. Pray that God will bring somebody into your midst that you can share about the love of Christ. We're just going to have a time of silent prayer. And I want to ask you if you're alone, just you and the Father, you just pray for, for these on our list. If you're with a room full of people, that's great. Pray with them. And let's just lift up our voices to the Lord. And then after a little bit of time, not enough time to pray for everything you want to pray for, but I will close. And then we'll close the service and you can continue praying. Let's pray together. Did that we 
can stand over them and point fingers because father we have we have turned on you before father i pray that you would just help us to be more and more pleasing to you father i pray that you would uh, just help our church during this uh, this time and lord i pray that your kingdom will move forward even in the midst of this virus. Father, I know there are several of us that are trying to decide, several of our members who are trying to decide whether this is a good Sunday to start back. And Lord, I just pray that you would give all of us wisdom. Now, Lord, bless us as we, uh, as we go about our evening and may all that we do bring glory to you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. Well, good night.